Have you ever paused to consider what being disabled can really mean? Sir William Purdy Trelaw did. The daily sight of the many little cripples in the streets of the City of London had for long distressed him. And as Lord Mayor of London, early this century, he dedicated his year of office to raising funds to found a hospital and college, not only to alleviate the suffering of these children, but also to provide for them facilities for vocational training and education. His dream found support, not just within the bounds of the City of London, but throughout the country, and especially from Queen Alexandra. Trelawa's dream came true, and in 1908, the Lord Mayor Trelawa Cripples Hospital and College were opened at Alton in Hampshire under a board of trustees. Later, a hydrotherapy hospital was opened at Hailing Island. The majority of the early patients suffered from crippling disabilities caused by non-pulmonary tuberculosis. New methods of treatment were pioneered or perfected at the hospital at Alton. It grew to become one of the most important orthopaedic hospitals in the country. Today, the hospital still continues its great work and many babies and little children receive the treatment for which it's still famous. In 1948, the hospital was taken over by the newly formed National Health Service. The college, which had always been an integral part of the hospital, was refounded by the trustees at nearby Froyle as the Lord Mayor Trelaw College for Physically Handicapped Boys in an Elizabethan mansion, to which purpose-built extensions have been added over the years. A few years later, the trustees built another specially designed school for similarly handicapped girls in neighbouring Hollyborn, the Florence Trelaw School. Named after the Lord Mayor's daughter, who'd done so much to continue his great work for disabled children. Princess Alexandra, whose great-grandmother, Queen Alexandra, took such an interest in the founder's work, has honoured the trust on more than one occasion by visiting both the school and the college. The close connection with the City of London is still maintained. Each Lord Mayor is an ex officio trustee, and many find time in their busy year of office to visit the college and school and to interest themselves in the Trust's welfare. The school and the college are non-maintained special schools. The pupils are, in most cases, sponsored by their local education authorities. The trust does, however, rely on voluntary donations to meet all capital expenditure and to provide a substantial subsidy for the running costs. Innumerable subscribers, including many private groups and organisations, make generous contributions to the trust, and some of these have been for specific items or projects. Today, the Trelawa Trust cares for over 200 boys and girls, aged from 9 to 19. They come from every part of the United Kingdom, and some from abroad. Children with any physical disability are admitted, and a wide range is represented. Cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, spina bifida, fragile bones, heart and chest disorders, haemophilia, injuries sustained from road traffic accidents, and more tragically today, even from bullet and stab wounds. Only the totally deaf, the dumb or the blind cannot be accepted. Thanks to new drugs and improved standards of living, tuberculosis, Trelaw's original concern, is now mercifully almost a disease of the past. 
But as each such disease is mastered, so some other major cause of disability seems to arise, and the Tuluwa Trust has had constantly to anticipate and adapt to the ever-changing needs of each generation. As TB was conquered, so poliomyelitis took its place as the disease most involving the Trust's activities. Immunizing vaccines have now virtually rid us of polio, but other disabilities, such as those associated with spina bifida, have taken its place. The greatly increased survival rate of spina bifida babies, the result of modern surgical practice, has in many cases swelled the ranks of boys and girls with the problems of paraplegia and incontinence. In fact, at present, spina bifida children form the largest combined disability group at the college and school, and the largest individual group at the girls' school. To cope with this current large number of incontinent children, the Trust has had to adapt and extend its specialised bath and toilet facilities, and to provide a greatly increased number of showers to train and enable these incontinent boys and girls to become as self-reliant and independent as possible. Although in recent years the tendency has been for the college and school to attract the seriously handicapped, or those suffering from multiple handicaps, one of the principal aims of the Trust has always been to train and encourage these youngsters to achieve the greatest possible degree of independence and to equip them to lead as nearly normal a life as possible, no matter how severe their disabilities. Over a third of the boys now at the college, more than 50 of them, suffer from haemophilia and allied disorders of the blood. This is by far the largest number of haemophiliacs concentrated in one place in the British Isles. It is perhaps not generally realised that haemophilia is a very much more serious condition than just a simple inability to stop bleeding. For instance, when a haemophiliac accidentally cuts himself or undergoes surgery or a tooth extraction. Haemophilia is a genetically inherited defect in blood coagulation, transmitted through the female line, but only afflicting males. This inability of the blood to clot means that bleeds can occur spontaneously, often into joints or muscles, occurring even while the haemophiliac is asleep. In severe haemophilia, frequently recurring bleeds can cause considerable joint damage, and the muscle bleeds can cause severe contractures. The residual damage to joints and muscles can lead to severe and crippling disability. Bleeds in joints are also exceedingly painful, and to alleviate suffering and minimise damage, it's very important that all bleeds are treated expertly and promptly. Experience at the college over many thousands of bleeds has shown that 10% of the haemophiliacs will be reporting a fresh bleed on any given day. And in cases of severe haemophilia, there could be one, two, or even more bleeds a week. It should be emphasised that as yet, there is no cure or long-lasting treatment for haemophilia. There's only treatment for each bleed as it occurs. In haemophilia A, the missing coagulation factor in the blood is factor 8, and this can be replaced temporarily by transfusion of fresh frozen plasma, cryoprecipitate, or a very potent freeze-dried concentrate. The exact dosage must be calculated with reference to the patient's own factor 8 level, his weight, and the level of factor 8 required. This depending on the site and severity of the bleed. Although with the advent of concentrates, home treatment is both convenient and practical for minor bleeds, there are definite problems. A haemophiliac or his relatives may be unable or unwilling to perform the necessary transfusions. The haemophiliac may have poor veins which render transfusion impossible by the inexpert. The patient or his family must be able to differentiate between a minor bleed and similar symptoms which may be masking a more serious bleed. In a severe bleed, very large and repeated doses will be necessary. The procedure must be carried out in a special haemophilia centre so that the transfusion may be prepared under strictly sterile conditions. It's often necessary for the contents of as many as 40 bags or more of cryoprecipitate to be transferred to a single donor bag for the transfusion of one dose. In addition, there's always the remote but very real possibility of an immune reaction on transfusion, which can prove fatal in the absence of expert medical supervision. 
the risk of such reactions is reduced by the use of the newer factor 8 concentrates but inherent in their use by virtue of their mode of manufacture is a greatly increased risk of serum hepatitis. Moreover, only under direct medical supervision can the most effective pain-killing drugs be administered. Specialized haemophilia centers of necessity are few and far between, and a haemophiliac may find himself 40 or more miles from the nearest center, which can mean a long and often very painful journey to obtain treatment. At the Lord Mayor Trelaw College, treatment is received rapidly when a bleed is reported, and the boy is usually back in school within an hour or two. Suffering and tissue damage are therefore minimized, rendering the essential remedial follow-up by the physiotherapists more effective. At home and in ordinary schools, parents and teachers are often overprotective. Hemophiliacs are isolated and debarred from ordinary social activities, and they themselves dreading the often painful consequences of a bleed, sometimes tend to be fearful and unadventurous. When they arrive at the college, haemophilic boys are given freedom to discover their real limitations, often for the first time in their lives. From time to time, a haemophilic boy who has previously been limited to a wheelchair with expert physiotherapy and orthopedic management at the college is able to walk within a matter of months. To prevent a bleed occurring during the treatment, a transfusion is often necessary before physiotherapy can be carried out. Merely to arrest a bleed by transfusion is not enough. This is only part of the treatment. Subsequent physio and hydrotherapy are absolutely vital to restore mobility and maintain muscle tone. This is especially important at an age when boys are growing and developing rapidly. Lord Mayor Trelaw College is uniquely geared to the management of haemophilia, working as it does very closely with the Lord Mayor Trelaw Orthopaedic Hospital at Alton with its haemophilia centre and research unit. This large haemophiliac population at the college for nine months of the year has for the first time enabled close observation to be made of a large and significant number of sufferers of this particular disease by both clinical and laboratory methods. These studies have revealed much new information of value in the fields of rheumatology, hepatic disease and venous thrombosis, as well as the obvious benefit in the management of the disorder itself. In the same way as the trust is uniquely geared to the management of haemophilia by virtue of its 70 years of experience in caring for, educating and training children with every form of physical disability, so today, the college and school are ideally suited to cope with the present increase in the number of boys and girls who were born with total or partial absence of limbs as a result of the tragic use of the drug thalidomide. These thalidomide children have merely highlighted the age-old problem of children born with congenitally absent limbs, a problem with which Trelawers have been coping for years. Children come to the college and school at various ages. The youngest boys and girls enter the Florence Trelaw School from the age of nine, where they live in a new junior house with their own common room, play facilities and care staff. This new junior house provides the all-important continuity of education which so many disabled children lack. They enjoy all the facilities of the senior school, including the use of video recorders and a host of other visual aids. At the age of 11, the boys transfer to the junior house of the Lord Mayor Trelaw College, while the girls continue at the Florence Trelaw School. Although the full age range is from 9 to 19, not all pupils stay for 10 years. Some enter at 11, 12 or later. Some leave at 16. Many need an extra year's schooling because of hospitalization and the need for consolidation both educationally and socially before going on to further education or a job. In the junior forms, all pupils learn to type.
When necessary, typewriters can be used in the classroom or even in the laboratory. With obvious benefits. For some, a special electronic typewriter such as the Possum or Electrade is their only means of written communication. Even public examination papers can be typed, sometimes from a bed in the sick bay. A variety of special furniture and equipment has to be provided. Desks and laboratory benches of varying heights and design for use by pupils with differing disabilities. Library shelving that can be reached easily from a wheelchair. For some, of course, the floor is the obvious answer. It takes a special attitude of mind for the authorities to allow an expensive microscope to be used in this way. But then the staff have great understanding of the problems of the disabled, some from personal experience. Both schools offer a wide curriculum, with courses leading to the CSE and GCE examinations at ordinary and advanced levels. At sixth form level, there are advanced level courses being run at the girls' school and commercial subjects at the college. All pupils are encouraged to achieve their full academic potential. It's particularly important for those with a physical handicap to be able to make their way in a competitive society, often by using their heads more than their hands. And ex-pupils have gone on to universities, technical colleges and colleges of further education. You can find them in many different careers, including the civil service and banking. At the boys' college, a number of training courses are offered for those over 16. These courses include horticulture, run in conjunction with the Sparshold College of Agriculture, commercial subjects, and tailoring. The radio, television and electronics course may be particularly suitable for a student in a wheelchair providing he has the use of at least one hand. In recent years, boys completing the course have obtained immediate employment in electronics firms or as television servicing mechanics and junior laboratory technicians. All these courses lead to national professional qualifications, such as those offered by the City and Guilds of London Institute. The surgical boot and shoemaking course, for example, offers entry into a skilled trade where mass production can never replace individual craftsmanship. One boy who took this course came to the college paralyzed from the waist down after contracting polio when he was 12. He's now married and in charge of the surgical boot and shoemaking department of a national firm of surgical appliance manufacturers. With several other ex-students from the course, working under him. At the Florence de Law School, from the second form upwards, all the girls learn to cook. They're introduced to a variety of kitchen aids, the majority of which are readily bought on the ordinary domestic market. Simple modifications to other equipment enable the majority of girls to cope in the kitchen, irrespective of their disabilities. All the girls learn needlework. A number of manufacturers have produced sewing machines that can be successfully used by many of the disabled. Other manufacturers even supply a variety of special control adapters for their standard machines for this purpose. There are also simple but very helpful devices, from gadgets for threading needles to self-opening or battery-operated electric scissors, making an otherwise difficult operation either possible or easier. There's a resource center as everywhere else, the benches are at a variety of heights to suit any disability. Here, girls have access to a wide range of visual aid material, slides, film strips and recorded tapes in easily used cassette form to supplement the well-stocked library. There's also a language laboratory where French and German are taught. In the sixth form, girls have cheerful individual study bedrooms. There are cheerful and well-equipped gymnasiums to encourage movement and exercise.
Both the college and the school are divided into houses by age. Pleasant common rooms with libraries and games encourage social contact, as do visits to outside clubs and discotheques. One house at the college even boasts its own coffee bar, built, organized and run by the boys themselves. Crafts, such as printing, and other hobbies encourage the pupils to participate and to integrate. Both schools offer a wide range of out-of-school activities. Nearly half the girls and many of the boys learn to ride. Riding is now well recognized throughout the country as an activity which many disabled can enjoy, no matter how severely handicapped. Riding stables now often provide pits to help with mounting. and equipment is easily adapted to individual needs. For haemophilic boys and others debarred from riding, there's always driving. Less arduous, but just as challenging and rewarding. Pupils at both schools can learn archery, another sport that attracts the disabled to clubs throughout the country, both while they're at school and after they leave. There's badminton as well, basketball, tennis and cricket for the energetic, with croquet, putting and even angling as quieter alternatives. A high standard is achieved, both nationally and internationally. The British swimming team at the International Paraplegic Games in Canada was composed entirely of pupils or ex-pupils of the Florence Tenor School. For many disabled youngsters, the swimming pools at both schools offer special benefits in the form of exercise. Nearly all the pupils learn to swim and pass their tests, some their highest life-saving awards. One very severely disabled boy recently passed the test, refusing to give up, although it took him two hours to take his shirt off while swimming in the water. The swimming pools also provide a safe training area for canoeing, a popular sport, particularly at the girls' school. In the pool, pupils can safely practice capsize and recovery procedures, and even master the vagaries of a coracle. The girls are often called upon to demonstrate their skills at the Crystal Palace National Sports Centre by the British Canoe Union during their annual national exhibitions. Dinghy sailing is popular with the boys. They sail at an outside club on equal terms with more able-bodied enthusiasts. There are chances too of sailing in a big yacht and even to savour the thrills of taking the helm. A number of girls and boys enter the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme, which has a special syllabus for the disabled, with the accent on effort expended rather than on physical achievement. A wide variety of activities can be offered, from flower arranging, which these girls are doing as part of their gold test, to rifle shooting, which these boys are practicing on a military range under the guidance of army instructors. These two girls have just completed their three days and two nights camping and canoeing test for their gold medals. A considerable achievement for any teenager, let alone a girl in a wheelchair. They're met by staff and friends and celebrate with a well-deserved outing in a canal narrowboat. To achieve all this not only requires enormous organization based on years of experience, but complicated timetabling to ensure that all these activities can be carried out without interfering with schoolwork. It calls for a very high staff-student ratio, not only teachers, but care and nursing staff, as well as porters, 
and the usual domestic start. The getting up and putting to bed alone of some pupils is a major operation. Certain dormitories, bedrooms and bathrooms have to be equipped with special lifting hoists. Dormitory accommodation has to be arranged so that heavier and immobile children are at ground floor level for rapid evacuation in case of fire. Covered pathways, ramps and lifts must be provided to give wheelchairs complete freedom of access to all buildings. Transport and drivers must be available to take children to hospital appointments or for outings. The sick bay of the college is virtually a small hospital in its own right, with skilled nursing and medical staff. At both the college and the school, the timetables of individual members of the teaching staff allow for periods of instruction in the sick bay, so that pupils can, if possible, keep up with their lessons. Working in close conjunction with medical consultants in many parts of the country, it's often possible to time surgical treatment to coincide with school holidays. All this avoiding the serious loss of education often experienced when disabled children have to attend normal schools. There are also special remedial classes with individual attention to help those boys and girls who are having difficulty with their schoolwork due perhaps to previous loss of schooling. Other specialized facilities carefully allowed for in the daily timetable include hydrotherapy, which can be so helpful in the treatment of a wide range of disabilities. And of course, physiotherapy, which plays such an important role in the lives of so many of the girls and boys. Under the guidance of the occupational therapist, the youngsters are introduced to simple but effective aids to enable them to do all the little things that we take for granted, to get from a bed to a wheelchair, to comb hair. To do up buttons. Put on socks. and pick up things dropped on the floor. Little things, but so important for independence. Yes, the college and school are certainly special schools. Very special, special schools. Offering unique opportunities for disabled children to develop their academic, physical and social potential to the full. Often, where attempts are made to integrate a physically handicapped child into the normal educational system, he or she has to compete with their able-bodied companions against overwhelming odds. All too often, these children turn inwards, dwelling on what they cannot do or participate in, rather than on what they can do. And inevitably, they tend to be left out of many social activities and conversations. The college and school of the Trelawa Trust, however, have always tried to give to disabled youngsters the courage and self-reliance to go out into society as balanced and mature young adults, to take their full share of responsibilities in family and community life. Just as was done in 1908, nearly 70 years ago for Walter Owen, one of the very first of the crippled children to enter Trelawa's new hospital and college. He hardly ever missed returning on the annual Founders Day to the college which had done so much for him, had taught him to overcome his disabilities, and helped him to live his long life to the full. Surely, an inspiration to these youngsters, the present generation, 
and proof that the founder's dream has indeed come true.